I read an article just uh, last week all about a famous actress. Um, she was in some really big movies. She had the fame that so many people dream of having. Um, and then, all of a sudden, she just stopped. She stopped making movies. She stopped making TV programs. And she just disappeared into obscurity. And this article I was reading, it was talking about how even though it's now more than 20 years since she was last on the screen, um, I think she was 39 20 years ago, so you know, it was a surprise that she stopped. But even though it's more than 20 years ago, every so often she still appears in those sort of trashy celebrity magazines. Um, and the reason is the paparazzi just keep on going after her. And every few years, there'll be another article and I'll say, you won't believe what she looks like now. You won't believe what she's up to now. And the magazines, they absolutely gawk at her. Because here's this woman, and she used to be a big star, and now she's buying groceries at the supermarket, like an ordinary pleb, just like us. Anyway, the question that this article was asking was, why do the magazines do that? Why do we want to see pictures of what this actress is up to now? Why don't we just leave her alone to live her life in peace and live it the way she wants to live? Well, one of the big reasons that the writer puts his finger on is that we live in a world where being famous is just about the highest honour that it's possible for someone to have. Or at least that's how we see it. Now, we see that, for example, in social media. You think of people on TikTok, for example, and views and likes, that is the height of attainment. That is what it is all about. That is what people want to do. And, and people today, they just can't understand why you would have a woman like this actress, and she used to be a household name, and everybody knew who she was, and people actually wanted to watch her work, and she gave it up. And people simply cannot understand that. They can't understand why this woman wouldn't cling to that with her fingernails. Well, it's not just people today who are baffled by that. Because as we're going to see tonight, it was also people in Jesus' day who couldn't get their heads around that. Because Jesus, if he wants to, he can be a massive star at this point in Mark's Gospel. Jesus, if he wants to, can be the most popular, most loved, most sought after man in the whole world. And yet, he leaves it all behind. Or, at the very least, he doesn't chase after it. He doesn't try to cling on to his fame by his fingernails. Because for Jesus, there are some things that are far, far more important than being famous. And we're going to see that tonight. So we've got two points this evening. First one is this. Jesus had an audience of one. Jesus had an audience of one. Now, do you remember last time we saw that Jesus had this unbelievably busy day? And it runs from verse 21 right the way through to verse 34. And you imagine what it must have been like for Jesus and for the disciples as they crawled into their beds at the end of the day. You think of all the different people they've spoken to. You think of all the, the harrowing personal stories that people have told them. You think of all these hours that they have spent walking around these sick people. Finding out what's wrong with them. Hearing their stories and Jesus ultimately healing them. Uh, you think of how exhausted they must have been. And these houses in ancient Israel, they weren't big. And so there's every chance that Jesus and these men would have been very tightly squeezed into a small space. Uh, they might have even been 
sharing beds for all I know, but they would have been very, very close together. So you imagine what it would have been like for Peter. You go to bed and you sleep like a baby because you're absolutely exhausted from this massive day. But then you wake up and what is your very first thought when you wake up? I wonder what Jesus is going to do today. So you turn over in your sleeping mat, you look towards where Jesus was when you close your eyes and he's gone. He's nowhere to be seen. Where is he? Well, verse 35 tells us the answer. He left the house hours ago. He has gone to go and pray. Verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place. Where he prayed. Now of course that shouldn't surprise us. Because we're often told in the Gospels that Jesus prayed. So for example Luke tells us that Jesus prayed at his baptism. He tells us that he prayed just before he called or he chose sorry, the twelve disciples. And we're told that Jesus prayed at the transfiguration. We're told that the whole reason why Jesus taught the Lord's prayer to his disciples was basically because they walked in on Jesus and he was praying and they wanted to pray like him. We're told that Jesus prayed for Peter's faith. We're told that Jesus prayed before he rose Lazarus from the dead. And and even actually, whenever he's on the cross, whenever the rest of us would be so consumed, so out of our mind because of the physical agony, we're told about Three different times that Jesus prayed. The best example of all, I think, is John chapter 17. Uh, We sometimes call it the high priestly prayer. And it's just so moving because we have the very words, the very prayer of Jesus recorded. And he prays and prays and prays and prays and prays for his followers. And that's not even all the examples. And even aside from those examples, and even aside from the other examples that are included in the Bible, there must be thousands and thousands of times that Jesus prayed and it was never written down. But why did he pray? Well, for the same reasons that we pray. We pray because we face temptation. We pray because the evil one does his level best to coax us into disaster. We pray because of the pressure that we face, the pressure to conform to the world, the pressure to choose the path of least resistance. We pray because of our physical weakness. We get tired. We get weary. We lack physical strength and so we pray. We pray because of the endless need that is all around us. So many people, so many problems. And the problems that people have are so severe and so difficult that we can't not pray. We pray because it's easy to feel worn down. Because living faithfully takes its toll. Because caring for other people, helping to bear other people's burdens, staying faithful in the face of pressure, standing firm against temptation, getting up every single morning and doing it all over again, it grinds us down. And so we pray. We pray for strength. We pray for patience. We pray for perseverance and wisdom and fruit and progress and a hundred other things besides. And so did Jesus. And yes, Jesus was God. And yet, Jesus was fully man. And he didn't come into this earth to live out half the human experience. He wasn't half God, half man. He wasn't a mix of God and man. He was fully man, as well as being fully God. And so he came to live out the full human experience. He came to be the real man who really lived the way that God had set out. And so Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are. And so Jesus faced weakness so that he can sympathize with us in our weakness. And so Jesus faced discouragement and tiredness and hardship just like us. 
and as the perfect man faced those pressures and as he lived the perfect life of trust and devotion, he prayed. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed again every single day. And then he'd get up the next day and he'd pray all over again. Because all through his life, Jesus had an audience of one. That's a massive challenge for us. It's something that really should make us very uncomfortable indeed. Because there's so many days that we're not like that at all. We're nothing like that. There's days that go by, maybe even sometimes weeks that go by, and we don't even so much as speak two words to God in prayer. And what's the implication of that? What are we saying when we go through an entire day without praying? Well, surely we're saying, I have less need to pray than Jesus Christ himself. I'm able to get by without the Father's help and without the power of the Holy Spirit more than Jesus was able to. And that's obviously a completely outrageous thing for us to say. And we would never say it. We wouldn't dream of saying something like that. And yet tragically, in spite of what we believe in our heads and in spite of what we confess with our lips... So often, that's the testimony of our prayerless hearts, isn't it? We need to be more like Jesus. We need to think and we need to focus far, far more on the audience of one. There's a few practical lessons that Jesus teaches us here. And I want us to take a bit of time to learn practically from Jesus' example. Um, First thing... Prayer was a priority. It's a priority. What's the very first thing that you do in the morning? Some people make coffee. Some people, especially this time of year, they start into revision. Some people get their phones out, they check and see how many views they've got on TikTok. But we all do something first. And what we do first says a huge amount about what is most important in our lives. What does Jesus do first? He prays. I think we should all be challenged by how Jesus gives prayer the absolute top billing in his day. Prayer is a priority. Second thing to mention, prayer takes discipline. Takes discipline. We saw last time round that Jesus had this incredibly action-packed day. He preached, he cast out a demon, he healed many, he cast out even more demons. It was an incredible day. It was me. I'd be turning the alarm off. For the next morning. I'd be looking for a lie. And I'd be feeling like I deserved it. You think of Jesus though. You think of how he must have felt. Whenever he woke up. I mean he must have been exhausted. He must have been drained. He must have been. And so you think of how much discipline it must have taken. For Jesus to get out of bed. To get out of the house. To go into the cold. To go into the dark. Rather than doing the obvious thing. Which is rolling back over onto the pillow. And yet Jesus did that. He wrestled with tiredness. He wrestled with weary feet. And he got out and he prayed. Now look, I I, I don't want to make this sermon into a huge big guilt fest. You're maybe thinking, well, you're doing a fine job of it. Um, But could it be? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely including myself in this, but could it be that actually, when it comes to prayer, we're just far too soft in ourselves? 
we allow our busyness or we allow some of the problems that come up to just completely derail the good intentions that we have. When really what we should be doing is we should be facing that busyness and we should be facing those problems and we should be doing our best to push on through and pray anyway. Now, now this passage, it's about far more than just preaching and, or teaching an example. And we'll get to that shortly. It's about more than teaching an example and yet it does teach us an example. And Jesus shows us when it comes to prayer, we need to be disciplined. Two more practical helps. First one, sometimes prayer takes space. Sometimes prayer takes space. Now, we see that in verse 35. We see that Jesus went to a solitary place. Um, In other words, Jesus got away from the things that would distract him. Um, He found space. Now, look. I realise this is easier for some of us than it is for others. I realise that some of us have got more space in our houses than others. I realise that some of us live with fewer people than others. I realise that some of us have got quiet places nearby that we're able to go to. And I realise as well that for the young mums... Uh, the very notion of getting away from everybody for an extended period of time is laughable. But, bearing in mind all of those limitations, is there somewhere you can go? Is there a place where you can find where it is your habit to go and devote yourself to prayer? Maybe it's a room in your house. Spare room and you sit on the floor. So be it. Maybe it's actually just a corner of a room and you're able to go there whenever the kids are distracted and you're able to play or pray. Maybe it's your backyard, as overgrown as it may be in your case. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's a quiet spot down the road where you know there's not too much passing by. It's not essential. Not having a place like that isn't enough to stop us praying. But Jesus, I think, shows us, if it's possible, it can certainly be very, very helpful. And if it's helpful for Jesus, well then why shouldn't it be helpful for us as well? Um, So practical tips from Jesus' example. Prayer is a priority. Prayer takes discipline. Jesus finds space. Final one. Prayer takes time. Prayer takes time. And now again, I'm not looking to guilt trip. But Jesus devoted a significant amount of time to the exercise of prayer. Um, he was away early in the morning. And he was away for so long that everybody else had time to wake up. They had time to go to Simon's mother's house. They had time to ask where Jesus was. And they had time to wonder if he's ever going to come back. And they had time to go out and look for him. And they had time to look everywhere and not be able to find him. It took a, he was away a long time. Very, very long time. Now look, I know that we have got lots of demands on our time. And I know it is not realistic for very many of us at all to disappear for hours on end to some solitary place so we can pray. And yet, surely most of us could give more time to prayer than we currently do. Because there's plenty of things we do find time for. Don't know if any of you are watching through any sitcoms at the minute. 20 minutes an episode. Maybe you watch four episodes a week. Maybe you watch more. 20 minutes, four times a week, that's almost six hours a month. Maybe you find time to read the paper. Or you find time to check the football results. Or you have time to have a very quick scroll through Instagram. But it all mounts up. 
And how good would it be if we were to take even a small portion of the time that we find for other things and we were to invest it into following Jesus' example? Surely all of us want to have a deeper relationship with our audience of one. So Jesus had an audience of one. Secondly, far more briefly, Jesus had an audience of of many. Jesus had an audience of many. And the reason I'm going to be brief here is that we already sort of saw it last week and we're going to keep on seeing it as we go through Mark. Um, But I've got a question to start with. Um, I listed towards the start of the sermon uh, a whole stack of times where the Gospels tell us that Jesus prayed. Here's the question. How many times does Mark tell us that Jesus prayed? How many times? I don't know what number you have in your head. It's probably lower. Three times. Just three. Now, Mark is obviously not telling us that Jesus only prayed three times. But whenever we realise that Mark actually is very selective about the times he tells us Jesus prayed, we should be asking a question. And the question is, why? What is the point that Mark is trying to make? Why does he ignore the other times that Jesus prayed and only tell us about these three? What is so special about these three times? Well, it does get a bit more clear whenever we look at what was going on those other two times that Jesus prayed. And so this is the first time that Mark tells us about Jesus praying. And notice, of course, it is right at the very beginning of the story of Jesus' ministry. The second time is in chapter 6. It's right in the middle of Jesus' ministry. And it is straight after Jesus feeds the 5,000. The third time, you may be able to guess in your head, is the Garden of Gethsemane. Right at the end, as Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. So three times. Question is, what do these three times have in common? Well, they are all times when Jesus had a particular temptation to face. We know from John's gospel that right after Jesus fed the 5,000, the people wanted to crown him as king. Right there, right then. But that's not why Jesus came. I mean, yes, Jesus is a king. He's the promised king. He's not shy about announcing that the kingdom has come. And yes, Jesus is wearing a crown of glory right now. But before Jesus was to put on the crown of glory, he had to put on the crown of thorns, didn't he? That was his destiny. And if Jesus had allowed himself to be swept up by this wave of enthusiasm and adulation, it would be a shortcut. It would be a detour from the path that his father had set out for him. He would be skipping the job that his father gave him to do. So Jesus, knowing what the people wanted to do, he prayed for grace and strength. Surely that's at least part of what he was praying for. He prayed that he'd be able to to keep on walking the path that his father had set out for him to walk. And then we have Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was so aware of the sheer horror, the sheer torment and agony and hellish experience of bearing our sin on the cross and so much so you may remember he tells his disciples my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow even to the point of death and Jesus of course was facing incredible temptation in that moment the temptation to try and find another way any other way other than going to the cross the temptation to take a shortcut to take a detour, to go any way that doesn't pass through this horrific moment. So Jesus prays. 
if it is possible, take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And here he is in chapter 1. And he has just become a really big deal. And people are absolutely amazed by the miracles he performs. And even at this very moment in verse 35, as he is entirely focused on his audience of one, there is a massive crowd that is searching out all over the countryside to see where he's gone to. And why are they looking for Jesus? Because they want more. They want more teaching. They want more, well not really teaching so much. They want more miracles. They want more healings. They want more exorcisms. But that is not why Jesus came. Yes, of course, he will show pity to everyone he meets. And of course, he does perform great signs and great wonders. But those miracles, they're all designed to underline the message that he preaches. Because the message is more important than the miracles. And the message is what we have already seen in verse 15. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Here's Jesus. And he's at a fork in the road. He can be the man the crowd want him to be. He can spend his time doing miracles and doing wonders. And if he does that, he'll be a superstar. He will be the most popular man who has ever lived. Or he can carry on with the task that he came to do. He can carry on with the mission of the Messiah, which is to die on the cross. And of course, Jesus isn't going to die on the cross just yet. But for now, he's preaching the message of the cross. And the people in this town, they've had their chance to hear that message. And now, verse 38 and verse 39, Jesus is going to go to other towns. And he's going to bring the message to them instead. Because the people in Capernaum, they've heard already. And they need to make their minds up. They need to decide whether they're going to repent and believe or just not. That shows us. It's not enough to simply know who Jesus is. It's not enough to have it all right in here. The demon knew that. We see that in verse 24. I know who you are. It's not enough. No, Jesus says that his message demands more than just knowing the truth. You need to repent. You need to believe. It also shows us that it's not enough simply to be amazed by the message. It's not enough to appreciate the message. Because the people in Capernaum were absolutely blown away by everything that they heard. But it's not enough. We need to respond to it with repentance and faith. We need to confess our sin. We need to put our full trust in the Lord Jesus and in his strength, we need to turn away from the way of death and turn to the way of life. And the tragedy that we're going to see eventually is that most people in this town, town of Capernaum, they didn't do that. Yes, they saw the miracles. Yes, they were amazed by the miracles. They didn't embrace the message. They were like men at sea who were drowning. And the lifeboat pulls alongside and they're amazed by the lifeboat. They're amazed by how fast it is. They're amazed by how it tears its way through the waves. But they ignore the life rings that are thrown out. Question is, what will you do? 
It's not enough to know the truth. It's not enough to sit here and get your head full of knowledge from God's word. It's not enough. You need to come to Jesus in repentance and in faith. Will you do that? Well, if you do, then Jesus' salvation is for you.